of the day, we want to say thank you. We say thanks to all the moms who stayed up with us when we were sick, who spent numerous hours dropping what you were doing to help us. Who put our needs ahead of your own and who cared for what we care about. While no words or gift can ever equal all the ways you show your love, today, we want to let you know how much it all means. Thanks for showing us what God's love is like and for all you do every day. Hey, Ballard Church Online, I'm so glad you decided to take a little bit of time and join us this Sunday or really whenever you're watching this during your week. It, for us, it is Mother's Day today. So to all you moms out there, happy Mother's Day. We're so glad you took a little bit of time. Today we're going to be celebrating moms, but more than that, we're just going to be celebrating the people that make huge investments in our life. We know this to be true here at Ballard Church, and come on, you know this to be true in general, that God doesn't just speak to us personally. But oftentimes, he'll speak to us through other people. He'll speak to us through the wisdom uh, and grace and hope that other people can bring into our lives as well. And isn't there just this unique brand of mom wisdom that comes to the table? There's just these mom sayings and mom phrases. And, and I wrote down a few that I know I've experienced through my, through my relationship with my mom. And, and maybe you've experienced some of these too. Uh, things like, if you were too full to finish your dinner, you're too full for dessert. Have you ever heard that one? Or uh, when, uh, when you have kids— uh, of your own, you'll understand. Do you remember that? I, that was like one of my favorites. I remember my mom, she, go, she told me once when I told her I was running away, she goes, oh, you're gonna run away? I'll help you pack. It'll be fine. We'll make that happen. Um, another one too, if you put things where they belong, you'd be able to find them again. Stop acting like your father. My wife says that one a lot. And then this last one, man, I, this one, you have to, if you had a mom who loved you as much as mine did uh, to me, then you've heard this before. I brought you into this world and I can take you out of it. Do you guys remember that one? Come on, there's specific just mom wisdom that comes to the table, but, but more than that, even though today we celebrate moms that, that bring just a unique brand of wisdom and godliness to our life, they really do speak God's principles and grace to us, but more than that, just in general, we have people in our lives who speak just this wisdom to the table, and I want to bring a quick message today just to encourage us to be receptive, and then at the same time, wonder where we can be that person for somebody else. Because we know this, come on, we know this to be true, that God leverages other people to speak to us. And I think there's three areas or avenues or, or types of communication that God can speak through other people to bring to us, and, and we have to be really aware to receive it well. Because if we're not careful, I think oftentimes we can just take it as another conversation, we can take it as another passing thought. We can take it as just something quick that's from another person. But if we're really, really careful, I think it can come from God. And if we're especially careful and you, follow your, you call yourself a follower of Jesus, I think what's so special about this is we can be the mouthpiece of God into other people's lives. And when we do that, man, I'm telling you something unbelievable can take place. So this is the first thing. I want to go through three of them. Remember, I think God uses people for three different ways. And the first one is this. God uses people to communicate his encouragement. I think he uses people to communicate his encouragement. And come on, encouragement changes everything for all of us. In fact, I was reading the other day uh, a book by John Maxwell, and he referenced a study done at a, at a university where they brought college students in, and they had them stand in a bucket of ice water and see how long they could last. This big, huge, empty uh, room, uh, this big teaching hall, they had them stand on the stage, put their feet in ice water and see how long they can last. And after that group, they brought in a second group. But before they did, they filled the auditorium with other college students. And the other college students who were watching, their only job was to shout encouragement the whole time, to cheer them on, to get behind them and cheer them on. And wouldn't you know it, the second group lasted twice as long in the ice water. And why is that? And this is the lesson that you and I learned too. If you're going to get in ice water, go second. It's already warmer. No, come on. You know, that's not, that's not the case. Come on. You know it's because encouragement allows us to do something more. It fuels something inside of us that unlocks untapped potential. It just, it sets a unique brand of almost adrenaline inside of us that unlocks a sense of capacity that we didn't know I ha that you had. It says this in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and do good works, not neglecting to meeting together, but 
as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another. Let's not give up meeting together, but really let's lock in. And when we get together in the same space, let's encourage one another. Come on, encouragement can change so much. And if, and if you've had an incredible mom like I did, encouragement can be spectacular. But I'm talking about a deeper brand than just the rah-rah or the you can do this or just leave here today and tell everyone that you really like their shoes or that they dress well. I think there's something deeper than that. And especially in today's culture, I think we've really adapted a high sense of whether or not people are being fake. I think we've, we've really started to build up this, this meter to see when people are faking it or when they're not being genuine. We're really keen to authenticity. And one of the ways that I think encouragement can change for each of us is when encouragement becomes specific and personal, right? Because there's something about general encouragement that's nice, but if you've ever had to encourage somebody that you don't really know, it gets challenging. That's when you start to lean towards the haircut, or isn't it nice we have the weather, and isn't this great, and something superficial, or I bet you do a great job at this, and it seems like this, but but when you know somebody, when you have a discernment about who they are and what they're about, you can call out something specific. And that's what I think is beautiful about the church, about the body of Christ and what Jesus invites us to in our relationship with one another, is to get to know each other on a deeper level, on a more sensitive level than just the passing compliment, but to see the way that God has wired somebody and call out the best in them, to see the way that God has put a gift in someone, the way that he's really challenged them and bring them up with a unique and specific brand of encouragement. When we do that, I think everything changes in our relationship. And I want to make sure I get encouragement out of the way first, because that's a fun one, because the next one, the next way that I think God speaks through people can be a little bit more challenging. I think the next one can be a little bit more difficult. The next one, maybe we got to put our seatbelt on for this one, because it can get hard. God uses people to communicate his correction. (laughs) Come on, you knew this was in theme with Mother's Day. Mom can be encouraging, but mom's also going to set you straight at the same level. Come on, mom is going to tell you when things need to change. And as much as we don't like it, as much as it seems difficult or challenging, we all know that there's somebody in our life who needs to tell us when we're maybe off base. That every bit of feedback we, we get can't always be Disney. It can't always be fun and chase your dreams. If, if you need somebody to speak into your life, I'll do it. Some of your dreams are dumb. Some of your dreams are foolish. They're unwise. In fact, the Bible speaks to this. We even referenced this a few weeks ago in our misquoted series. But, but here's what it says. There's a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. There's a way, come on, there's a way to each and every one of us that we think is going to be right, we get excited about, we're eager for, we daydream about. We're going to think it's so enticing and alluring, but at the end of the day, it leads to death. And the only way, the only thing that stops us from going down the road that ultimately isn't going to lead us to something fruitful is the correction of other people. We just have to be in a place in order to hear it. And when it comes to correction, I think this is where the church has done well, but also has done a lot of harm because oftentimes in the church we feel like it's our responsibility to be the police of things, that we're going to be the faith and spirituality police, and we're going to tell everyone what they're doing wrong and point a lot of fingers. And so we just all cover it up under the guise of correction, the fact that we can just, we're going to be the correcting people, and aren't you glad that I'm in your life to tell you all the ways that are, you're doing stuff wrong? But the Bible teaches us something different. The Bible calls us to speak the truth in love. The Bible tells us to speak truth to people. Yes, that is so important, that is so powerful, but to do it in a way that's loving, to do it in a way like Jesus did for so many. He, he was un, unashamed about the truth. He was unequivocal about what truth was, but at the same time, he did it in a way that was compassionate and approachable. Here's what it says in Ephesians chapter 4. I think this is so great. Instead, speak the truth in love. We will grow to become in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. When we do this, when we speak the truth in love, there's a sense of maturity that comes to the table. When you have somebody who brings correction to you, not just because they feel like it gives them a sense of power or because they feel good about themselves afterwards or it's control, no, that kind of thing. But when you have someone who really has your best interest in mind who can speak correction to you, I think it brings a sense of maturity. That's what teachers are supposed to do, right? Teachers are supposed to help grade and correct. You're supposed to submit things. They bring assessment and critique to guide you into a better direction so that next time you can do it on your own. Again, aren't these the kind of people that can be challenging to meet with, but the the type of people that we love, 
And I think the best way, if you're wondering today, okay, when I'm bringing confrontation to somebody, not necessarily confrontation, but just correction to somebody, how do I know if I'm doing it in truth and love? I think the easiest way is to identify the fruit. What comes of it? What happens when you bring somebody truth and love? Is it immediate defensiveness? Does it break a relationship? Does it end up with, well, at least I said my piece, or, or I had to get it off my chest, or, or is it a sense of power play? Because at the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves a challenging question when it comes to how we correct other people, and it's simply this. What is my motivation in correction? What's my motivation in correction? This could go for any of us. This could go if you have a roommate, if you have a spouse, especially true if you're a parent here today. You need to wonder what your motivation in correcting a behavior is. Is your motivation just because you're tired? Just because you don't want to hear him make that silly noise anymore? (laughs) Or is your motivation because you truly want the best for your child? Is it because you want them to grow up in a way that honors Christ? Is, is, Is that your motivation and what it is? Or is it just a motivation to get them out of your hair for a moment? I understand how challenging it's been, and after a year at this point, a a year plus of pandemic and a lot of time at home for families, as I talk to other parents, the the thing that I get the most is it just seems like a lot. There's no release. There's no relief. There's there's no break. It's hard to find a sitter. You can't visit family as much. There's no break from being a parent. You don't just get to hang up that hat for a while. And what happens if we're not careful is that we start using correction as our main tool for parenting over love and I think it gets us in a really challenging place. Because ultimately, remember, our goal is to speak God's truth, is to be God's mouthpiece into our children, to raise them in the way that honors Christ. Here's what it says, the very last point for this one, this is the last verse for this point, is is listen to advice and accept discipline. And at the end, you will be counted among the wise. This is for each and every one of us. Are we in a position or in a place where we can accept discipline and correction from other people. Because if we do, the Bible would call you wise. And isn't that the way you want to be described in your life, is a wise person? Isn't that how you want people to talk about you behind your back, is that you're wise? And this is the great news. I actually think more than encouragement and and even more than correction, the thing that we can glean from other people, the thing that God speaks to us through others, is ultimately to get to just that, wisdom. He can communicate his wisdom. He can communicate uh, a level of insight that is just absolutely unbelievable, and uh, it can really happen organically through relationship, and we really have two options when it comes to wisdom. We can either experience something and gain wisdom from it, whether it went well or went bad, or we can learn from other people, and that I think is, is the easiest way and really the healthiest way to find wisdom is to really glean from other people what they've already experienced. Here's what we see in Colossians. This is an incredible verse. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. So what do we do? When, when I'm rooted in a, in a relationship with Jesus, when I'm, when I'm really centered in a relationship with God, parents, this is again so challenging and encouraging for us. When we center our lives and our focus around Jesus, it begins to overflow in our relationships, and it begins to really bring our teaching and admonishment starts to bring wisdom to other people. It starts to really bring the best out of other people. It starts to bring insight and discernment, kind of like what we talked about with encouragement. It can change so many relationships. I think bigger than anything, wisdom is a legacy that we all aspire to leave. More than a great inheritance financially, more than a great stock portfolio or great real estate portfolio, more than a great job and a great title that we left behind, more than a company that you helped build, although those things are all incredible. I think what we all aspire to leave is a legacy of wisdom, a legacy of helping people draw close to Jesus, a legacy of helping people find freedom and hope and true and authentic joy. Maybe a a legacy of encouragement, or maybe a legacy of always being the person who was willing to say the thing that other people didn't want to hear, but you said it in truth, and you said it in love, and you said it in such a way that people didn't feel ashamed, or they didn't feel overly guilty or terrible about themselves, but they were really challenged to, to rise up to a higher standard, like a great coach could bring to the table. At the end of the day, wisdom becomes our legacy, and and that's really one of the major reasons that we celebrate moms today. It's because they can bring such an incredible sense of wisdom to the table, but for any of us, this is a challenge. 
though moms, yes, have a unique platform into the lives of their children, I think any of us, when we earn it, have access to bring wisdom to other people know. When we earn that platform of credibility, can bring wisdom and leave that as a legacy behind us, regardless of what our relationship, it doesn't have to look like mother-child, doesn't have to look like father-child. It, it can look like a many, many different things, but, but each of us have the opportunity to bring wisdom to the table. One example that I think is absolutely incredible that we see in the Bible is Paul speaking about one of, speaking to one of his young apprentices, Timothy. And this is what he says. I just think, this is so encouraging to me. I think about this every Mother's Day. I thank God, who I serve, this is Paul talking, as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience. As night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. Come on, Paul talks to Timothy in a way that when I see you, I get filled with joy. And why is it? Why do I get filled with joy? Um, I reminded of your sincere faith. This is incredible. Which first lived in your grandmother Lois, and, and now, and then, excuse me, was in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. He talks about this sincere faith. This sincere faith that was first he saw in your grandmother, then I saw it in your mother Eunice. It was absolutely incredible. And now, now Timothy, it's almost like this generational thing, this legacy took place that you looked to them and you learned from them and you gained this wisdom and ultimately through their encouragement, their correction and their wisdom, that you now have this sincere faith, this thing that, that brings joy to the people around you, the thing that encourages people, the thing that is changing the lives of others and is really even changing your life too, Timothy. And for each of us, isn't that, what we, isn't that what we strive for? For each of us, at the end of the day, isn't that what we hope for? That as we look back on whoever we have the, the privilege to impact with our own story, isn't it true that at the end of the day, we hope that it cultivates in sincere faith? If there's one thing that you could hand down to the next generation, a faith that's rooted and centered in Jesus Christ, that's really grounded in what God did through his son Jesus and on a cross to bring us redemption and hope. That, that is what we hope to pass on to the next generation. And so many of you have already been a part of that story. Even the opportunities you take here at Ballard Church to serve others is absolutely incredible as I hear story after story come in of people taking the opportunity to serve one another and bring about the sincere faith, allowing God to use them to speak his truth to other people in a personal way. This Mother's Day, I hope we leave encouraged, encouraged and challenged that we can walk away and we can play such a pivotal role in somebody else's life, but it's only if we choose to. And for many of you, you were thrust into that responsibility when you became a parent. For some of you, you were thrust into that responsibility uh, into a family member's life or when you, when you pseudo-adopted somebody into your sphere and into your family, when they became a close friend or a close connect. You know exactly what I'm talking about, but I think there's an opportunity that each of us have, if we're really careful and if we're really strategic, to be the mouthpiece of God to somebody else's life. And I'm telling you, it'll change their life forever. If we had enough time, I could go back through so many stories of people who have done exactly that for me. And I'm just so eternally grateful. I think of them, and it brings joy, because I think of their sincere faith that I hope has been passed on to me as a legacy, and I hope that I can pass on to my kids as well. So, as we close here today, I just want to remind you that you have the chance, that you have the chance to do something incredible in somebody else's life. And really, uh, you have the opportunity to speak God's encouragement. Even sometimes uh, you can bring God's correction and God's wisdom to the table to ultimately uh, mature itself and bear the fruit of sincere faith. Man, what a chance we have. This Mother's Day, would you bow your head with me? And I'm going to pray for each and every one of us. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for everybody who took the time to watch today. We celebrate moms, especially on this day. And though we know year-round what an important role they play in our lives today, we just take a moment to be really cognizant of it. We take a moment to just really focus on that. And we're so, so grateful. Jesus, for everybody watching today, let us remember the responsibility that we have to steward, that we could be your mouthpiece in somebody else's life. What an opportunity it is. At the same time, help us look around to find the people around us who can speak your truths. Let us be open and receptive to encouragement the same way that we're open and receptive to correction. 
Ultimately, Jesus, we hope to learn from other people's wisdom. When we do that, we become more well-rounded in our faith. And today, I just pray for a sincerity of faith. When, when people look at us and when they look at the impact we make on other people's lives, let sincere faith be an indicator of our fruit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you guys, and I can't wait to see you right back here at Ballard Church Online next Sunday.